This is number six on the Folly of Good Friday, and what we're doing is more or less looking at uh, things that Christendom, as far as uh, it's concerned and its relation to the world are concerned, um, are okay. Uh, they would think that it's fine to do some of the things that they do. But we believe that they fall under the category of religious tradition and that for the most part it's absolutely wrong. And we spent a whole lot of time this morning looking at the four-generation curse and especially as it's related to tradition because that's what it is. Any belief or set of behavior that is translated from generation to generation is a tradition. And if it's in error and yet it has a spiritual connotation, it's religious in nature. And those traditions end up getting the third and fourth generation judgment. Now, of course, there's judgment all along the line, but we're talking about judgment in time. Whether it is a famine, whether it is disease, whether it is war, whether it's bad weather and so forth. Um, the, the curse eventually comes upon um, a person or group of people uh, in that form. But now we also noted, before we get back on the bad traditions again, that there are some good ones. We noted some secular ones uh, this morning, but we had been going through that of the Apostle Paul, and he said to hold the traditions. And then he also used the same uh, Greek word, but the English word was translated ordinances. Here we're going to look at another Greek word in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17. But it all has to do with what Paul wants us to observe in the dispensation of grace. That's why we um, advertise. We're a Pauline assembly. You know, that sets us apart. Uh, we don't follow the Apostle Peter. Uh, we don't have a combination of Peter and Paul. We have Paul alone. So that's why he says here in verse 17, For this cause have I sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance, and here is what we want to see, Hodos, my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every uh, church. Now, Hodos has a, has a direct interpretation of that of a way, or a path, or a road to a certain direction, uh, uh, or in a certain direction. But secondarily, it means mannerisms. It's the way he was, it's the way he accomplished things, the way he did things. And he says that he teaches that way in every church, and that's something that he wants handed down. Uh, I could not begin to tabulate all the generations from this point back to the Apostle Paul, unless I had some time. But um, we are generations from him. But you know what we're still doing? We are uh, learning, we, are, we have been handed the baton of the grace message, and we are attempting to hand it to others. And so that's what we're doing here in this, um, in this uh, uh, looking at tradition. There's nothing necessarily wrong with some traditions. They're founded in the scriptures. The Greek word is the same. However, we learned this morning that and won't it be great? Well, all I have to do is press the space bar and that comes up. <laughs> uh, ho hopefully it'll work that way. That's what we're shooting for. We have learned that if they are the commandments of men, the traditions of men, and the doctrines of men. Now, all three of these are used in relation to traditions. The doctrines is the content of the tradition. It's what the tradition is. Uh, what it suggests, um, what its substance is. Then the tradition is the thing that has been handed down from generation to generation. The commandment is that somebody says you have to do it. It has to be done this way. We've always done it this way. It's become a tradition and not to do it this way is to break the chain. You've broken the, the link in the chain. But we saw again this morning that there's something wrong sometimes with the traditions that turn from the truth. If a man gives you a commandment that, uh, that is uh, attempting to turn you from the truth, 
If you are following a, a tradition that is not true, uh, or if you are learning something that is uh, false for application, then uh, the Apostle Paul says to uh, stay away from that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, if you'll turn to 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul himself uses his own tradition. Now remember what that was. We saw from chapter 2 of this same book. It's what he passed down verbally from church to church, but what eventually became settled in the canon of Scripture. We now have all of Paul's generational traditions in the canon of Scripture that we are to learn for this generation and hand over for the next. But he makes his traditions uh, the standard of orthodoxy. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly. Now, what is that? Not after the tradition which he received of us. Now, um, in, the, in the choir, we learned... Uh, the word uh, tonight, uh, ecumenical, um, and uh, exactly what that was. Now, ecumenical uh, philosophy is that I'm okay, you're okay. Whatever you believe, it really doesn't matter. After all, God is this is a great big fuzzball of love up there on his throne, and we just love everybody. Doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what your doctrine is, as a matter of fact, creeds and doctrines we throw out the window because we just want to love one another and we get to, together on the basis of that love. Now the problem with that is that there are countless scriptures that tell us to mark people regarding what they believe, to have fellowship on that basis. And here is one of them here. Um, withdraw yourselves from every brother. Here is a Christian who is ecumenical. Anything goes, yes, he's saved. But he walks disorderly. How do you walk disorderly? Well, he just came out of the tavern. He's just stone cold drunk. He just took some drugs. No, I didn't say that. He's walking disorderly in that he is not adhering to tradition. Whose? Well, the divinely mandated tradition that comes to us uh, through the Apostle Paul. So he uses his tradition as, as orthodoxy. You see, that is the truth. And so God commands us this day to follow Paul and his teachings. Any other teachings that, uh, that turn from his authority, that turn from what he teaches us to do in this dispensation, um, in actuality become religious traditions that are either the commandments of men, the traditions of men, or the doctrines of men. Now, let's go to um, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And here we're going to find these phrases used. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 7. Now we're going to look into greater detail in Matthew 15 and Mark 7 uh, a little bit later, It'll probably be next Sunday, and we'll deal further uh, with this. We'll see how far we get. But right now I want you to see that these uh, things that I have here on the overhead are actually scriptural phrases. Traditions per se are categorized in three aspects. One, the commandments of men regarding them. You must do these, our authorities tell us. Secondly, uh, it is your responsibility not just to learn it from the past, but to pass it on to the future, we're told. And then, whether or not that content turns from the truth, we still are to follow the doctrines of men. Now, the sad thing about some of these things is that you get the crucifixion of Christ right from the scripture. Uh, but Good Friday is, is a concoction. It's a perversion of the truth. 
Uh, we get the fact that Jesus had a triumphal entry with palm branches laid in front of him from the scriptures. But Palm Sunday is not true. And it, uh, you know, the one, as we've studied, influences the other. If you have a Good Friday, then you have to have a Palm Sunday because of the countdown. But if you have a, a bad Wednesday, then you have, <laughs> then you have a good, uh, good Friday as the triumphal entry rather than a good Sunday. So the one influences the other, but they're religious traditions. And you've just got to observe Good Friday. You've just got to observe um, uh, Palm Sunday. Well, those are the doctrines, traditions, and commandments of men. Uh, verse number seven. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And so doing, you lay aside the commandments of God. Verse number nine says, you do it that you might keep your own tradition. All right. Uh, let's go to um, the book of, uh, of Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter two. We'll be back here in just a little bit. And in verse number eight, it says there, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we, uh, we have the, um, the commandments of men. We have the traditions of men. One last thing, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 9. And uh, it's a takeoff. We actually have it uh, in uh, another place as well. But in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And uh, in the, the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul talks about um, the doctrines of men as well. We'll see that in just a little bit. But these three phrases are found in the scriptures. The commandments of men deal with men demanding that we observe a tradition that turns from the truth. And uh, we have that, as, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know, when we started uh, t teaching on this long time ago, I know several of you told me, well, I got a lot of guff from my family because they said we always do this. It's important that we keep this tradition. Uh, and uh, yet you said, well, I'm not going to do it. You broke their commandments. Well, that, that's fine. You don't have to listen to that type of, a, of an authority if the commandment of that person, though he might be an authority in your life, is one that is forcing you to observe a falsehood. Secondly, a tradition. You don't have to pass it down. That's where the four generation curse comes in. You need to break the link in the chain from one generation to the next. How can you do that? The law of volitional responsibility says that somebody stands up for the truth and says, I'm not going to do it. You're breaking tradition. Yes, that's true. But I'm going to be responsible for my life and for future generations. If they're going to be judged, if they're going to be judged because they disobeyed God, not because I was an example for them to disobey God, because I insisted that they follow a tradition that turned them from the truth. And then, of course, the doctrines of men. We could go on and on, we'll, we'll not do it, as to what people believe with regard to these certain holidays and so forth that are passed down. We think that they are wrong. Now we're going to get, come back to this in uh, a little bit, but we want to turn to the book of Colossians again. The book of Colossians again. Now, just a word of explanation. Um, please note that I've got them. 
I'm, I'm be, I've got and I'm beginning to get all of this computer power and printing capability <laughs> at my disposal. And of course, I, I'm going to have to uh, watch and budget both my time, uh, creative time, study time, and also how much, how much I'm, I'm going to print at any one time, because I want you to have as many as possible. But here's my goal. See, I can take this and I can reduce it and I can do the study with all of the verses and so forth, just like we did the Palm Sunday one. On the one side we had the one model, on the other side we had the other, and I can put them there. Uh, so that is my goal, that you will have everything that I have up here in your possession, but it, it's just going to take time. And um, uh, I ask that you do, uh, do pray for me uh, with that regard, but that's been my dream. To be able to hand you a completed study without any typos, <laughs> without any misspelled words, I am praying that it will be possible because I, you just don't know. It kills me. I kick myself. My backside gets, sometimes gets a little raw because that miss, one misspelled word, I can't sleep at night. And of course it uh, has detrimental effects on my health and, and home and everything else. Uh, Wake up grumpy. And de okay. So, if you uh, will understand uh, and, and be patient with me, we're, we'll get it to the point where we have the best that we can. Now, it might not be what somebody else can do, but we'll have the best of what we can by way of doctrine. Now, what we're going to do now is on the same subject of tradition as it, as it is applying here to, to all of the holy days, we're going to look at something that the Apostle Paul says in the book of Colossians that I think is unusual, um, very weird phrase. It's the only place in the scripture that it's used. We'll look here in Colossians chapter 2. And we'll start with verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Now, remember, this is going back to the law offerings that we have studied, the Feast of the Lord plus, and their meat offerings, and also the fact that some of the offerings that they had were offerings that they could eat, or in drink, they had drink offerings, or in respect of a holy day. See, why don't we keep those seven feasts of the Lord? Because the dispensation has changed, the agency has changed, the approach has changed, the ministry has changed. Uh, God is not now dealing with a covenant people, he's dealing with a non-covenant people by way of grace. And that, that changes the whole picture by way of approach. I don't have to re remind us that uh, we have, uh, have household salvation. We don't have to apply the blood. We don't have to keep the feast. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to be at the Temple Mount and so forth. Uh, we, we couldn't do it. Uh, none of us would make the trip. I know I wouldn't like it. But uh, anyway, or the new moon. This is every month. They, they, uh, on the first day of the month, they would blow the shofar. And thank God, they had a monthly, and then uh, the Sabbath days, every seventh day. They're shadows. We've learned about shadow theology. You look, and back at that time, they didn't know full well about Jesus Christ, but they knew something of him in the animal sacrifice, or the feast, or what have you. But now the Apostle Paul says, in relation to this holy day observance, don't let any man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Now, what is the Lenten season? It's where people begin to afflict their souls, where they voluntarily give up something. Again, associated with the work salvation. Mainly it comes from Catholicism, but all the other churches that are just offshoots of Catholicism with their shades and varieties and, and so forth. Um, it is a voluntary humility. That's what he's talking about here. Where you subject yourself to a system and say, boy, I am just so humble. Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm so religious, so righteous and spiritual. But know what he says about this. It's an interesting phrase. And in doing this, a worshiping of angels. And you think to yourself, has Paul gone out of his mind? 
what in the world does all of this have to do with the worshiping of angels? Why would he connect the two? Why is he bringing us to this point? Tooting into those things which he has not seen. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Isn't that interesting? It's a voluntary humility that puffs one up. Whoa! Do you mean to tell me that when you start submitting yourself to a, to a system of human religious works to, to earn merit before God, that it's actually human arrogance and boasting? Absolutely. That's what it is. I don't need the cross. I can get to heaven on my own merits. I can humble myself and give up whatever. You know, we, we laugh about all the things that they give up that are piddly. And yet, they're, they're boasting. Why won't God let anybody into heaven on their own works? Because it says, lest any flesh should do what? Boast. All glory's got to go to God or you don't get in there. So God had to devise a system whereby he gets all the glory and we get all the blessing because he did it on our behalf. And that's what Paul is talking about. You, you begin to observe these things for special reasons. Oh, just, you know, just a mournful look. And you, you look at the, some of those people that do it and, and they're just so pitiful looking. And I'm really having a hard time because I gave up this for Lent and that for Lent and so forth. And, you know, it, but it says not holding the head. From which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment. In other words, you're not clinging to the Lord Jesus Christ. The one, the, uh, the head is referenced to the brains. You're not thinking. Wherefore, if you're dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Why are you subject to traditions that turn from the truth? Why do you submit yourself to this type of system? And not, not only do you submit yourself to it um, uh, uh, once a year, but you do it year after year and throughout the, the seasons, there are the, the years rather, there are, there are seasonal things that come up that you submit yourself to. Here's Lent. Touch not, taste not, handle not. You know, uh, you can't have beef, you've got to have fish on Fridays. You can't touch it or you're unspiritual. You've got to give up something uh, because the flesh is going to be satisfied and you're going to have self-flagellation. You're going to really tell the flesh, I'm, I've got victory over you. I'm only going to drink one beer this week, not two. See the control you got? I'm dominating my flesh. They're all to perish with the using. But they're after, and note these two phrases, which is what we're looking at, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Yes, but, but these are men of the cloth. There's the problem right now. How can they have their theology straight if their collar's on backwards? How can it be? It can't be. But, but they're trusted men in the community, respected men in their churches and in their field. Nonsense. They're not telling you the truth. The work is complete in the cross, and that's all you need for your salvation. Human works and efforts are out, lest the flesh boast. Now, which have indeed a show of wisdom. Well, after all, every Lenten season we all reminds us we all ought to cut back. <laughs> you know, we we can't satisfy the flesh. Uh, this, this is a show of wisdom. Well, we all should be moderate in our, our approach to these things. But know what it says. It's a show of wisdom in will worship. And that's the point I want to get to. Will worship. Do you know something? Whether you like it or not, you worship somebody's will. And uh, the two people whose will are the options are either the Lord Jesus Christ or Lucifer. Do you know that these, these two are uh, creatures? Now, mind you, listen carefully. Jesus Christ is God who became a man, but a man's a creature. He became human flesh. He entered creation. Lucifer was an angel who became a god, small g. He is not the god, but he became a god, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the god of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. 
But both of these um, examples or models, if you will, have a will. Now, believe it or not, you follow one of them. Everybody who is religious follows um, one. Everybody who is truly spiritual follows the other. And uh, we'll uh, note uh, these, we'll, we'll look at them as we turn, first of all, to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And the first will we're going to look at is Lucifer's. Now, what did he say in essence? He said to God the Father, not thy will, but mine. Now, where do we get that? From two portions we've studied before, but in relation to this, being, being very religious, remember, Lucifer wants to be a god. Uh, Lucifer wants to be like God. But Lucifer doesn't want to do it God's way. So therefore, the problem is with his will. Remember, we've insisted for years now that the true issue in the angelic conflict is volition, your will. Verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How are you cut down to the ground? You've weakened the nations. You've said in your heart, and here is his five wills, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here is the epitome of ar arrogance. I will be like the most high. But he's doing it apart from the will of God for his creature existence. He said to God the Father, not thy will, but mine. So anybody who is unsaved and rejects Jesus Christ worships a will. Whose will is it? It's Lucifer's will. Remember in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, nothing external, Lucifer didn't do anything exter external uh, to sin before God, but God said, Iniquity was found in you. Well, where? At what point? At the point of his will. His will allowed himself to think that he could be God without God. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And verse number five, here's where man and all men subsequently that are unsaved worship a will. Verse number five, for God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be, you will be. Make this decision for yourself and something's going to happen to you. You're going to be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now. What is will worship? Will worship is the belief in your will rather than God's will and that you have strength enough in your will to do what is needed to be a God. Lucifer did and he got Adam to do it. And anybody who's following these religious traditions worship a will. First of all, it's Lucifer's and then their own. Think of the arrogance of man that in and of himself he has enough to get his sins forgiven, or he can contribute to the cross, or that he can pay for his sins, or that he can, apart from God, salvation, filling of the Holy Spirit doctrine, can control his flesh so that it is pleasing to God. That is arrogance. But where do they get that? They get it because they're very religious. Well, who are they worshiping? Not only are they worshiping Lucifer, they're worshiping themselves. It's will worship. I can do it. That's new age. I can be anything I want to. If I just do it, and I can be God. I can have a breakthrough, you see. That's called what Paul calls will worship in relation to these religious observances. So this angel uh, became a God with his will. 
at least he thought so, man can be saved, man can be a god. Where? With his will. And so you begin worshiping the will. But now, let's look at the Lord Jesus Christ, our second model. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, if you're going to find out what God would do if he became a man, where would you look? You'd look at the person of Christ. In him dwells, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, if you want to know how to be per se, now understand he lived under law, we live under grace and, and so forth, but per se, if you want to understand what it is that God is looking for in a creature. Where would you look? Look at the person of Christ. He did not sin. He fully pleased the Father in his creature existence. Now, if he's going to come to the earth, you would wonder, what is going to be emphasized about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we, we note his parents, we note his uh, descendancy from Abraham and David and so forth, uh, and uh, on and on we could go with all the things that are emphasized, but what about him personally? I mean, does he have any goals? What is he here for primarily? Note what it says in verse 7. Then said I, Christ is, is speaking with regard to a personal objective. If he's going to become a man, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do what? Thy will, O God. What a difference in the two creatures. Now I'm speaking of Christ as the God-man, we know, we know that. But I'm, I'm talking about the contrast between the angelic creature and the human creature. Remember, that's what the conflict is about. Make him angel to angel. No, the Father said, I'll make him lower than the angels and he'll still defeat you. How's he going to do it? What did Christ use? What real weapon did he have? The first and foremost weapon was his will. But not a will apart from the Father, as we'll see in just a little bit. Note verse number nine. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will will O God he took away the first that is the old covenant which emphasized human performance conditionality that he might establish the second which emphasized uh, divine performance totally on behalf of, of mankind with the new covenant now you see we're we're noting something that Jesus Christ believed in the use of his will to accomplish the will of the Father. In fact, let's go, we, we know it by heart, but let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So, before his birth, it was written in the book about him personally. A lot of things about him that are grand and wonderful, uh, that fill our hearts with awe and adoration. But the one thing that should be outstanding to us is the contrast in wills. Why? Because Lucifer began worshiping his own will and he got men to follow suit. Whose will did Jesus Christ worship? The Father's. He didn't believe in his own will or that his own will, humanly speaking, was anything apart from the Father's will. He didn't do one single thing in sidestepping, circumventing, getting around, transgressing what the Father had for him. Here are the words that document it. Verse 42. Father, if you be willing. Now, mind you, 
In eternity past, there was an eternal life conference where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit got together and they devised plan A and then upon sin, plan B. Plan B had uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, ordained as the Lamb without spot and blemish before the foundation of the world to die uh, when sin entered, okay? But that was uh, uh, in eternity past. That was a long way away. Then God uh, created man and on uh, went the angelic conflict. But even then, he had 4,000 years to wait. Finally, after all this time, yes, I've come to do your will, O God, and here we are now in the garden where the rubber meets the road and his hour came. Here's the proof of the pudding and all the other cliches that we want to use. Is Christ really what he says he is? Is the Father's testimony about him true? Can I believe in the competency of this man? It, does he have the character, the sterling character, the superlative qualities and virtues that the Father says he has? Now we're down there to the nitty-gritty. Father, if it's, if it's your will, isn't there a way we can get around this? Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The issue in it all is the use of the creature will. The difference between Christ and Lucifer was that Lucifer began worshiping his own will, that he could be God apart from God, and that Christ only worshiped that of the Father, and therefore allowed the Father to promote him through the system the Father established. And this is the will that we should be uh, looking at. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Now we're going to notice in relation with this will worship, another strange phrase of the Apostle Paul. But it's centered on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it points our will to his. If you want to please the Father, do with your will what Christ did with his. He learned the ropes, so to speak. He learned the Father's system of spirituality, and with his will and divine enablement, he followed it perfectly to the end. That's what, that's what we're to do. Now, let's note verse number 16 in chapter 2. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We say, Pastor, oh, yeah, you just believe in Jesus Christ. That's not what it says. Genitive of possession. It's a faith that Christ possessed. It has to do with faithfulness or what he believed in. Do you ever ask yourself a question? What did Jesus Christ believe in when he was here? I mean, really? Uh, what did he follow? That's the point that we're trying to, to make. Jesus Christ had a faith as a creature, and he used his will to follow that faith. And it was that faith in, in the, the will that the Father showed him, uh, followed completely, that netted for him um, the glorification of the Father and blessing. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ. Note the, the, the difference. The faith of Christ and believing in Christ. That we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law. Here's the whole point. Jesus Christ knew that man in and of himself could not buy, purchase, merit his own salvation. Therefore, Jesus Christ faithfully stuck to the plan the Father had for his life, though it meant the cross. That was his faith. That's what he believed in. And it says, when he said, I've come to do your will, O God, he did away with the first, the law, the, the system of human performance in, in, uh, in giving way to that and providing for us a system of divine performance on our half. That's what the new covenant's about. That's what the grace message is about. For by grace are you saved without works, lest any man should boast. That's what Jesus Christ believed in. So anybody who says, I believe in Jesus Christ, doesn't understand what Christ himself believed in. 
that there is no such thing as salvation by means of observances of religion, religion, uh, religious rites, rituals, and so forth. He believed that only he could provide salvation, that he would fulfill the works of the law on behalf of those who could not do it. So, uh, Jesus Christ believes in something. Let's note again verse number 20. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, note, not by Paul's faith, though he had it, but, it, but I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus Christ believed in something, and what Paul now says is that he still believes in that. The life that I now live in the flesh, I, I live because Christ believes in something. He's still holding true to, to the tenets of that faith that he had when he came originally. And I'm alive and saved because he hasn't changed his mind. His will is fixed, as it were, upon that creed that he gave himself to while on earth and at the right hand of the Father. He still believes the very same thing. That if I'm going to be saved and that if I'm going to be right with God in any way, I'm going to have to, to trust Jesus Christ to do that for me uh, and on my behalf. It's his faithfulness for me. All right, let's look at one other portion. Romans chapter 3. Time is just about up. And we'll read these, but we're going to make a contrast again first. Whose will do you worship? I guarantee it's one or the other. If you worship Lucifer's will, which is being religious or righteous apart from God, then you not only worship his will, but you worship your own. You're arrogant enough to believe that there's something strong enough in you. I mean, just by sheerly gritting your teeth, you can, you can get through. But if you believe what Christ believed, and that your will is, is yielded to that of the fathers, and that's what Christ fully believed, and he still does, then you don't believe in your own competency, you believe in His. Uh, you don't believe in your own worth, you believe in His. You don't believe in your own system that you concoct, you believe in the system God revealed and mandated, you see. That's what Christ believes in. Here's what we're to believe in with, uh, with regard to this. Verse number um, uh, 21. But now the righteousness of, of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, that is the faith of Jesus Christ. Who got the righteousness of God to dispense it to others? Jesus Christ. How did he do it? He was willingly faithful to God in his system. The faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, we're talking about tradition here, commandments of men, the doctrines of men. Jesus Christ, as we will see next Sunday, um, repudiated all three of these in favor of God's will, which he followed, and that's the direction that we should go. Whose will are you going to worship?